AMD's new Ryzen 7000 CPUs are here, and to test out just how good their new Ryzen 5 7600X really performs, we're going to build the best Ryzen gaming PC you can put together with a mid-range budget in 2022. Is AMD's latest CPU a step change from their 5000 series architecture, or does it importantly beat out what Intel's 12th gen has to offer, or are you better sticking with a Team Blue base build and avoiding AMD's new options altogether. Let's find out. Gigabyte Aura 17 range of gaming notebooks are fantastic for playing the latest AAA titles at the best settings. With a 1080p 360Hz display, these are awesome for competitive gaming, featuring 12th gen Intel Core processors, which boasts phenomenal single and multi-threaded performance for gaming and productivity applications. Learn more and check out the full range at the first links in the description below. Now let's begin, shall we, by taking a look at this new CPU and talking a little bit about what the Ryzen 7000 architecture is all about. It's AMD's smallest CPU manufacturing node yet and brings with it initially four new CPUs, the 7950X, the 7900X, this, the Ryzen 5 7600X, and in between them all, a brand new Ryzen 7 processor too. Unlike Intel, which have spun off with new performance and efficiency cores, all cores and threads in these new AMD processors are made equal, with this particular unit having 6 cores and 12 threads. Once again, you keep the standard 2 threads to a core ratio, with AMD's equivalent of hyperthreading, and pretty efficient TDPs, though they have sneaked up a little bit over the last generation. The architecture also brings support for DDR5 memory. DDR4 RAM is not supported at all, but more on that important point later. You get widespread PCIe 5 support, providing you choose the right motherboard. Once again, we'll come back to that. And an architecture which paves the way for next-gen graphics cards, which will require the extra bandwidth and CPU power afforded by these new chips. In our testing, the Ryzen 7600X actually stacks up pretty well. It beats out the 12600K in most scenarios, though doesn't provide a particularly resounding lead at the moment. Future BIOS tweaks may change that, and the single-threaded performance on these is pretty good. Clock speeds are consistently boosted to this processor's max of 5.3 GHz on all cores with a good cooling solution. The only caveats to give it really would be that the expensive DDR5 memory I touched on a moment ago does make this a much more pricey option than an Intel 12600K, which supports much cheaper DDR4. And to really make the most of all the PCIe Gen 5 support, you'll need to buy an X670, X670E, or one of the cheaper B chipsets. There's so many numbers. The cheaper motherboard chipsets, the B series, are set to land in October, but for the purpose of this build, we'll be using one of the best value X670 boards we can buy. You can read a detailed review of this CPU in the card section now, over on geekawatt.com and linked in the description below, and we'll be looking at gaming performance in more detail once the whole thing is actually built. Now to get this whole thing actually built at all, we need to first install our new CPU into a brand new motherboard. This is the Aorus X670 Elite AX. Now, as referred to earlier, there's four new chipsets initially for the AM5 architecture. You've got your B series and your X series. In addition, you then have E versions of both, standing for Extreme, which gives you much more widespread access to PCI Generation 5. If you take a look at the box, you can see it says PCI 5 ready, NVMe only. That means to get PCI 5 support for graphics cards on motherboards, you've got to spend more. Something we're not particularly, if I'm honest with you, enthused about. To install the CPU, things have changed a bit over the previous AMD generation, and quite significantly. You'll notice here that for the first time in ages, the pins are actually on the motherboard, not on the CPU. What we need to do is we need to find the golden triangle on our new AMD Ryzen design, and match this up with the one on the top left 
left corner of our AM5 socket. Drop the chip gently into place, but just be really careful because the pins on the socket can be very delicate. They're very easily bent and that's not something we want to do. Even with my careful fingers, I've managed to bend pins on the Intel 12th gen platform more often than I'd like to admit. So let's avoid that mistake for AM5. It can also be a little bit unnerving as to whether it's actually seeded correctly. So feel free to very carefully remove it and reseed the processor if you're a little bit unsure. It is a bit more finicky than some of the previous CPUs we've had hands on with. You can give it a slight wiggle, but don't do anything too aggressive. You will bend the pins. Otherwise, pop the cover down. That feels a bit better this time and add the arm into place. You will notice from the design of the processor that we've kept the black brackets that will allow backwards compatibility with AM4 coolers, but just be careful. Coolers which use these brackets to mount onto directly can struggle a little bit in our testing with getting the best contact on the CPU's heat spreader, and they can actually bend some of the corners or apply too much pressure on the edges of the CPU rather than hitting the center of the integrated heat spreader. Coolers like NZXT's lineup tend to do a slightly better job here, and I'm hoping our Cooler Master unit today gets nice contact on the processor. These chips can run hot, so make sure you've got a good cooler to keep them nice and chilly. We're gonna add in 32 gigs of RAM from Corsair. This is their Vengeance RGB DDR5, and it's the next kit on the list today. I'll actually link the updated Expo version of this memory down below. Expo is kind of AMD's new equivalent, sort of, to XMP, and the idea is it gets rid of some of your latency on your memory and provides those high speeds that DDR5 delivers. This video is gonna contain quite a lot of tangents, so bear with me. The only hesitation really at the moment about this new Ryzen architecture on the mid-range is the RAM. DDR5 currently is not really any better than DDR4. That's because the latencies on the kits are so high it counteracts the added speed that these give you. Of course a kit like this at nearly 6000 megahertz is great but if it's running at a cast latency of double what you had with DDR4 your chip can't access all the data particularly quick enough and that can affect benchmarks. Pick up an Expo kit for now to help counteract this with a lower cast latency of around 30, 35 max, and you should do a bit better. But as I say, are we gaining much with DDR5 over DDR4? At the moment, no. If anything, we're probably losing a bit. If you've ever installed a RAM kit before, the next step is not gonna surprise you. We need to pull back the dims on the second and fourth, the clips, sorry, on the second and fourth dims, slide the RAM into place, apply pressure with both thumbs, and it will click in nice and easily. Repeat this for as many dims as you've got, pop your RAM in, and it's not gonna go anywhere, and install nice and easily. Next up, we need to install our M.2 SSD. And while I'm here, I've just noticed a cool new feature of this Gigabyte board, which perhaps points to some fairly hefty next-gen GPUs. Typically with a PCI slot, you have to kind of cram your finger in or worse, grab a screwdriver to try and dislodge the clip on the GPU holder. That can cause to the clip snapping off, create damage, and it can be difficult to get a good grip. By the looks of it here, Gigabyte have actually created a raised clip. So even with thick back plates on your cards, you've still got nice, easy access to undo your PCI slot. On the more expensive boards, you also get like a button, which is quite handy. But on this one, there's no button. It's just a raised clip, which is still better than what you'll find as standard. Grab yourself a small screwdriver like this one and uninstall our top M.2 slot. This particular one is a PCI Generation 5. So that's gonna work great for next gen NVMEs. And if you take a look under this second heatsink, this is one of the advantages of Ryzen that I don't think Intel is really competing with at the moment. And that's the room you've got for additional M.2 drives. Drives. Take a look at what is under this cover. Three more NVMEs. Wow. This top one right here is generation five. I believe the rest are all gen four, but that's still pretty good. Allowing us to have, well, I mean, terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of super vast storage. This does also have some nice little thermal pads on as well to dissipate heat from your drives onto the metal heat spreader. And you get these nice tallest clips, which are a little bit creative, a little bit different, and will hold the M.2 in without the need for any screws. I'm going to add in Samsung's SSD 980. In fact, now I think about it, I'm going to pop it in one of these lower slots and save the top one for those that will be installed in a Gen 4 or Gen 5 NVMe later on. There's no point populating your fastest slot with a drive that doesn't need the bandwidth because then later you just have to move things around and it creates that bit of extra and necessary work. Pop it in, use the nice tallest method to secure it and then we're going to add in all the heat sinks, one of which we definitely didn't need to remove. But never mind. As I alluded to earlier, these chips do need to have good cooling in order to stay nice and cool. And that's where the Cooler Master Master Liquid PL240 Flux comes in. 
Now this features a couple of 120 mil fans, mounting hardware by the looks of it for every CPU on planet Earth, and of course a nice 240 mil rad. This processor doesn't come with a stock cooler. AMD used to include stock coolers on basically any CPU they sold, even like Ryzen 7s and 9s. Those days are gone, and sort of for good measure, you do need to pick yourself up a decent cooler. Now with this being a water cooler, we obviously can't install the whole thing now, but we can prep the bit where the actual water block touches the processor. Installing our AMD specific mounting hardware now while everything is a bit easier to access. Right, so about 10 minutes later and I've sifted through all of our included mounting hardware to figure out what we actually need to do. We need to leave on the black brackets that come pre-installed, making our life a little bit easier, and instead pick up the CPU water block itself. Now you'll notice on the water block that on either side we've actually got two little indents and a slat. What we need to do is grab these brackets and actually pop them into our indent. You'll know which way round they go because if you try and flip them it simply isn't going to fit, not with the thread sticking out on the bottom. To pop it here, the way it will go in and add in two little screws on the bottom to secure it into place. By the end of it you should have something then that looks a little something like this. These brackets are just going to pop over the pre-installed black plastic mounts on the top and bottom of the processor. But before we do that we're going to move our whole motherboard assembly, which is now pretty much complete, into the case choice for this build. This is the Cooler Master TD500 Mesh, one of my favourite cases of all time. Although it is a little bit older now and lacks features like USB-C on the front panel, you still get USB 3, it's got a good I.O., loads of mesh, RGB fans, great airflow, fantastic build quality. I mean, there's not really much about this case I don't like. You also get dust filters at the top and on the bottom for any radiators, power supplies, that kind of thing, and it's going to be a great base for which we can build our system in. Take off the rear panel, unscrew the front panel as well, and that will just hinge from the bottom a little something like this and then lie the case down flat on a nice even table or work surface. We're going to quickly check that our motherboard is indeed compatible. Not only does the motherboard need to be the right size, but all the standoffs on the motherboard, that's these holes here and here, here and down the bottom, actually match up with the corresponding locations in the case. A quick cursory glance and it looks like we're sort of okay, but there's definitely ones that aren't quite in the right locations. Three at the top look all good. These two along the middle are fine, though we're missing one in the very centre here. And if we look at these two standoffs, they're too high up. They're for the smaller micro ATX form factor and as such need to be moved down. We're also missing one in the bottom right, so we're going to add that in for three at the top, three along the middle and three down the bottom. Once these are in the right locations, we can then go ahead and actually slide the motherboard into place. You're going to line it up over all those standoffs and check that the I.O. is popping through the rear of the case and then screw the whole thing in. Three screws at the top, three down the middle and three across the bottom. While we're here, I'm also going to go ahead and pop the radiator in. Now, because the CPU water block is already pre-prepped, we can just add our rad into the top. But remember, pop the fans on first. These will be exhausting the air from the front of the case out the top. And because, of course, our GPU is going to be the only other component heating the case up, the air it pulls in should be nice and cool, leading to good CPU temps and high clock speeds. Add the fans on, screw the radiator in, and then we can pop the water block on by just latching each of the two D brackets over the pre-installed plastic black hardware. Remember your thermal paste and plug up your fan header to the top of the motherboard to ensure your pump is actually going to spin. Don't be afraid to over tighten these a little bit as firm contact with the CPU is never a bad thing and a tiny bit extra thermal paste is also not a terrible idea to ensure good flush contact throughout. You know what? That's actually looking really good. The cooler's a good fit. It matches the aesthetic nicely and I actually prefer having a 240 at the top versus a 360 at the front. I think it just fills the case out a bit more. The one last component really out of our main bunch, we still need to give everything power, is of course the GPU or the graphics card. I've gone for Gigabyte's Eagle OC 3060 Ti with plenty of VRAM, lots of CUDA cores, second gen RT cores and performance that basically beats out any other competition. It's obviously better than a 3060, it's better than a 6650 XT while being cheaper than a 6750 XT. Gosh, the names nowadays are so confusing. It just ticks a lot of boxes. If you're looking to play games at 1440p, this is the card for you. As far as CPU and GPU combo goes, these two are pretty nailed on. Our Ryzen 7600X would also be fine with like a 3070, 70 Ti, but the 60 Ti for me is where it's at. 
We need to hover our GPU over the top PCIe slot. So if we just drop the graphics card in, you'll see here that we need to take out the second and third covers. These are the black ones just here at the back. Removing these is of course gonna allow our GPU to slide into place. On cheaper cases, these will be like a single use one whereby once you remove them, you can't put them back in. Thankfully, on this case, you can. So if you do change your GPU later, you put in a different motherboard, you're not too snookered. And if you take out the wrong ones, perhaps is the most common reason to have to put them back in. At least you're not stuck with random holes that are in the wrong places. Push your clip back, slide it into place, and apply a little bit of pressure. You'll get a nice click sound, and you'll see that notch that we talked about earlier flick right up. Aesthetically, it matches the motherboard perfectly. You can see the nice grey tones of the graphics card all tie in for a really cohesive looking build. Add in a couple of screws at the rear to fasten this down, and then we can wrap things up before looking at performance with the power supply. To juice up the entire system today, I've picked the Cooler Master MWE 750 Gold. 80 plus gold certified, fully modular, and with plenty of power for our PC today. We're going to pop in a motherboard, GPU, CPU, and SATA power cable to the power supply, then add the power supply in to the rear of the case and plug all of these cables and connections up to the motherboard. A full cables and wiring guide can be found over on our website as well for a bit more detail. And then we can boot the thing up to test out the performance and take a deep dive into how the 7600X compares against the more expensive Ryzen 7000 CPUs and its competition from last gen and of course Intel on the team blue side of the equation. Let's start off by looking at some of our synthetic benchmarks, then work through to the gaming ones shortly afterwards. In Cinebench R23, the Ryzen 5 7600X stacked up really, really well. In fact, single-threaded wise, it beat out any of the competition, including top-end i9 and Ryzen 9 chips from Intel and AMD respectively. AMD have killed it when it comes to single-thread performance, something which helps massively when it comes to gaming on these new Ryzen chips, the Ryzen 5 in particular. Move up to the multi-core and the 7600X still provides great gains over the last gen 5600X, though it does fall short to the i5-12600K rather understandably given it's 10 cores versus the 7600X's 6. In 3D Mark V Strike, the Ryzen 5 7600X also performed very well with an overall score that beat out a last gen Ryzen 9 and Ryzen 5, put the i5-12600K to bed and still provided great physics numbers which really puts a particular focus on the CPU. But all of these synthetic benchmarks mean nothing without a good old proper test of this build's gaming nous. And let's start off by taking a look at Formula 1 2022 first of all. A very demanding title, we expected good results from our 3060 Ti and Ryzen 5 combo, but perhaps nothing groundbreaking. We were in fact though pleasantly surprised, as at 1440p high we pulled in well over 150 frames per second on average, 156 to be precise. 90 and 99 percent our results were solid too, and we were very, very impressed with the performance we managed to gather here. In Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered, the results were once again very good, 1440p high, and we picked up 135 FPS on average. That's more than enough frame rate to saturate even your 140Hz refresh rate monitors, and well over the 60fps often deemed as acceptable in games like this. Apex Legends, we also got great results, well over 150fps at 1440p high, with more than 200 certainly feasible when you drop things down to 1080p. The game looked great, and our Ryzen 5 3060 Ti combo performed incredibly well. In Valorant at 1440p high settings, we also got great numbers, 400. 45 FPS on average to be precise, with strong 90 and 99 percentile results. All of the frame rates were tested as usual with MSI Afterburner's Reva Tuner and NVIDIA FrameView to ensure maximum fairness. Finally, we also tested out Fortnite at 1080p competitive settings. Here we pulled in an impressive 232 FPS on average, more than enough for even the highest refresh rate monitors at 1440p and 1080p, with great results across the board. A lag-free, stutter-free game and experience where this CPU showed its single-threaded mouse right front and center. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to get subscribed. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.